Hey, what's going on everyone? In this video, we'll see the math that explains how backpropagation works backwards through a neural network. So let's get to it. All right, we've seen how to calculate the gradient of the loss function using backpropagation in the previous video. We haven't yet seen, though, where the backwards movement comes into play that we talked about when we discussed the intuition for backprop. So now we're going to build on the knowledge that we've already developed to understand what puts the back in backpropagation. The explanation we'll give for this will be math-based, so we're first going to start out by exploring the motivation needed for us to understand the calculations that we'll be working through. We'll then jump right into the calculations, which we'll see are actually quite similar to ones we've worked through already in the previous video. After we've got the math down, we'll then bring everything together to achieve the mind-blowing realization for how these calculations are mathematically done in a backwards fashion. All right, let's begin. We left off from our last video by seeing how we can calculate the gradient of the loss function with respect to any weight in the network. When we went through the process for showing how that was calculated, recall that we worked with this single weight in the output layer of the network, and then generalized the result we obtained by saying that this same process could be applied for all other weights in the network. So for this particular weight, we saw that the derivative of the loss with respect to this weight was equal to this. Now, what would happen if we chose to work with a weight that's not in the output layer, like this weight here, for example? Well, using the formula we obtained for calculating the gradient of the loss, we see that the gradient of the loss with respect to this particular weight is equal to this. So check it out, it looks just like the equation we used for the previous weight we were working with. The only difference is that the superscripts are different because now we're working with a weight in the third layer, which we're denoting as big L minus one, and then the subscripts are different as well because we're working with the weight that connects the second node in the second layer to the second node in the third layer. So given this is the same formula, then we should just be able to calculate it in the exact same way we did for the previous weight we worked with in the last video, right? Well, not so fast. So yes, this is the same formula, and in fact, the second and third terms here on the right-hand side will be calculated using the same exact approach as we used before. This first term, though, the derivative of the loss with respect to this one activation output, that's actually going to require a different approach for us to calculate it. Let's think about why. When we calculated the derivative of the loss with respect to a weight in the output layer, we saw that this first term is the derivative of the loss with respect to the activation output for a node in the output layer. Well, as we've talked about before, the loss is a direct function of the activation output of all of the nodes in the output layer. You know, because the loss is the sum of the squared errors between the actual labels of the data and the activation output of the nodes in the output layer. Okay, so when we calculate the derivative of the loss with respect to a weight in layer big L minus one, for example, this first term is the derivative of the loss with respect to the activation output for node two, not in the output layer L, but in layer L minus one. And unlike the activation output for the nodes in the output layer, the loss is not a direct function of this output. See, because look at where this activation output is within the network, and then look at where the loss is calculated at the end of the network. We can see that this output is not being passed directly to the loss. So we need to understand how to calculate this term then. That's going to be our focus for now. So maybe if you need, then go ahead and pause the video here and go back and watch the previous video where we calculated the first term in this equation to see the approach we took. Then you can compare that to the approach we're going to take to calculate this first term in this equation. Now, because the second and third terms on the right-hand side are calculated in the exact same manner as we've seen before, we're not going to cover those here. We're just going to focus on how to calculate this term and then we'll combine the results from all the terms to see the final result. All right, at this point, go ahead and admit, you're thinking to yourself, I clicked on this video to see how backprop works backwards. What the heck does any of this so far have to do with the backwards movement of backpropagation? I hear you, we are getting there, so stick with me. 
we have to go through this math first and see what it's doing. And then once we see that, we'll be able to clearly see the whole point of the backwards movement. So let's go ahead and jump into the calculations. All right, time to get set up. We're going to show how we can calculate the derivative of the loss function with respect to the activation output for any node that's not in the output layer. We're going to work with a single activation output to illustrate this. Particularly, we'll be working with the activation output for node 2 in layer L-1. And that's denoted as this term. And the partial derivative of the loss with respect to this activation output is denoted as this. Now, as we discussed a few moments ago, observe that for each node J in the output layer L, the loss depends on the activation output from each of these nodes. Okay, now the activation output for each of these nodes depends on the input to each of these nodes. And in turn, the input to each of these nodes depends on the weights connected to each of these nodes from the previous layer, L-1, as well as the activation outputs from the previous layer. So given this, we can see how the input to each node in the output layer is dependent on the activation output that we've chosen to work with the activation output for node 2 in layer L-1. So again, using similar logic to what we used in our previous video, we can see from these dependencies that the loss function is actually a composition of functions, and so to calculate the derivative of the loss with respect to the activation output we're working with, we'll need to use the chain rule, which tells us that this derivative is equal to the product of the derivatives of the composed function. And we're expressing that here. So this says that the derivative of the loss with respect to the activation output for node 2 in layer L-1 is equal to this. This is the sum for each node J in the output layer L of the derivative of the loss with respect to the activation output for node J times the derivative of the activation output for node J with respect to the input for node J times the input for node j with respect to the activation output for node 2 in layer L-1. Now let's scroll a little bit. Now, actually, this equation looks almost identical to the equation we obtained in the last video for the derivative of the loss with respect to a given weight. Recall that this previous derivative with respect to a given weight we worked with was expressed as this. So just eyeballing the general likeness between these two equations, we see that the only differences are one, the presence of this summation operation in our new equation, and two, the last term on the right-hand side differs. The reason for the summation here is due to the fact that a change in one activation output in the previous layer is going to affect the input for each node J in the following layer L. So we need to sum up these effects. Now, we can see that the first and second terms on the right-hand side of the equation are the same as the first and second terms in the last equation with regards to weight 1, 2 in the output layer when j equals 1. So, since we've already gone through the work to find how to calculate these two derivatives in the last video, we won't do it again here. We're only going to focus on breaking down this third term, and then we'll combine all terms to see the final result. All right, so let's jump in to how to calculate the third term from the equation we just looked at. This third term is the derivative of the input to any node j in the output layer L with respect to the activation output for node 2 in layer L-1. We know for each node j in layer L that the input is equal to the weighted sum of the activation outputs from the previous layer L-1. So then we can substitute this sum in for z sub j in our derivative here. Now let's expand this sum. Then due to the linearity of the summation operation, we can pull the derivative operator through to each term since the derivative of a sum is equal to the sum of the derivatives. So we're taking the derivatives of each of these terms with respect to a sub 2. But actually, we can see that only one of these terms contains a sub 2. So then when we take the derivative of any of these other terms that don't contain a sub 2, they'll just all evaluate to 0. Now, taking the derivative of this one single term that does contain a sub 2, we apply the power rule to get the result. So this result says that the input for any node j in the output layer L 
will respond to a change in the activation output for node 2 in layer L-1 by an amount equal to the weight connecting node 2 in layer L-1 to node J in layer L. All right, let's take this result and combine it with our other terms to see what we get as the total result for the derivative of the loss with respect to this activation output. All right, so we have our original equation here for the derivative of the loss with respect to the activation output that we've chosen to work with. And from our previous video, we already know what these first two terms evaluate to. So I've gone ahead and put those results in here. And we just saw what the result for this third term was, so we have that result here. Okay, so we've got this full result. Now, what was it that we wanted to do with it again? Oh yeah, now we can use this result to calculate the gradient of the loss with respect to any weight connected to node 2 in layer L-1, like the one we showed at the start of this video, weight 2, 2, for example, with the following equation. The result we just obtained for the derivative of the loss with respect to the activation output for node 2 in layer L-1 can then be substituted for the first term in this equation. And then, as mentioned earlier, the second and third terms are calculated using the exact same approach we took for those terms in the previous video. So notice we've used the chain rule twice now, with one of those times being nested inside the other. We first used the chain rule to obtain the result for this entire derivative for the loss with respect to this one weight. And then we used it again to calculate the first term within this derivative, which itself was the derivative of the loss with respect to the activation output. The results from each of these derivatives using the chain rule depended on derivatives with respect to components that reside later in the network. So like for the weight we worked with in the last video, for example, to calculate the gradient of the loss with respect to it, we needed derivatives that depended on the activation output and the input for this node. Then, to calculate the gradient of the loss with respect to the weight we just worked with in this video, we needed derivatives that depended on this input and this activation output. And as we saw, the derivative that depended on this activation output needed the derivatives that depended on all of the activation outputs and all of the inputs for these nodes. So essentially, we're needing to calculate derivatives that depend on components later in the network first, and then use these derivatives in our calculations for the gradient of the loss with respect to weights that come earlier in the network. So we achieve this by repeatedly applying the chain rule in a backwards fashion. Phew, all right, now we know what puts the back in backprop. After watching this video, along with the earlier videos on backprop that precede this one, you should now have a full understanding for what backprop is all about. If you made it through all of these and you think you have a grip on this stuff, then cheers mate, I'm glad you stuck around till the end. Now, we've gone over a lot of math in this video, as well as the last several. So if you have any questions, let's have a discussion in the comments. Also, I'd love to hear what you think in general about this series of videos on backprop. Was it helpful in developing your understanding? How was it following the math? I'd really like to know what you're thinking. Thanks for watching. See you next time. <laughs>